friends, hello. It is a great pleasure to be with you today. In the framework of the conference, whose theme is a mind that embraces the universe, today I would like to talk about uh, what is ideally uh, required um, to make our mind all-encompassing and all-embracing. So let us begin with the simple definition of the word mind taken uh, in the secret doctrine. As a definition of mind, the secret doctrine states that mind is a name given to the sum of the states of consciousness grouped under thought, will, and feeling. It is the organ through which the ego manifests ideation and memory on the material plane. During the long night of rest called pralaya, says the secret doctrine, when all existences are dissolved, the universal mind remains as a permanent possibility of mental action or as that abstract absolute thought of which the mind is the concrete manifestation. Therefore, mind is consciousness in action. And in the absence of vehicles of its ex for its, its expression, can only be described as mind in latency or a possibility of mental action. Then I've looked into um, Timney's book, Man, God, and the Universe, and he's talking about the cosmic ideation. So Timney says, mind and consciousness are usually considered synonymous because they are closely intertwined in their expression and not easy to differentiate. But mind arises from consciousness. So there can be no mind without consciousness. Consciousness refers to the basic reality from which the mind derives in all its degrees of subtlety. And mind refers to the expression of that reality in its differentiated forms. The root of mind is the seed of cosmic ideation or divine ideation with an activity in reality and of reality. It is not the ordinary thought that underlies the basis of the manifested universe. It is the divine thought of the cosmic logos on the cosmic level and of the solar logos on the solar level. It is the origin of all the succeeding universes in the eternal alternation of pralaya and Manvantara. In studying the relationship between consciousness and mind, it is a matter of coming to an understanding of the subtle process by which consciousness is transformed into mind, that is, the process by which the integrated state of consciousness gives rise to the differentiated state of mind. It is the cosmic mind of which there are innumerable limited aspects in the manifested worlds. However, consciousness does not lose its essential character when it is transformed into innumerable differentiated mental states. The difference between consciousness and mind is essentially a difference between integrated and differentiated states. Consciousness and mind appear intertwined acting through the physical brain. We are living in a purely mental world. So-called matter is merely an aspect of mind. According to the science, nothing exists except mind energy and matter. Within the brain, something occurs which converts nerve impulses into sensations. Occultism knows that this transformation is brought about by the intervention of prana, which acts as a vehicle of the life force and can be regarded 
as a compound of matter and mind, enabling mind to affect matter and matter to affect mind. Nothing can be known definitely as long as it is studied in isolation and not seen as part of the whole from which all things derive and in which they have their being. This entire manifested universe is ultimately, ultimately a mental phenomenon based on consciousness. There are thus three aspects of the fundamental truth in the manifested universe, consciousness, mind, and matter. They are connected with ultimate reality, but we cannot know the mysteries of existence unless consciousness has transcended the limits and illusion of the intellect. Nevertheless, with the aid of the intellect and the intuition, we can try to grasp the best of our ability, the magnitude of the universe, of the universal consciousness, intrinsically linked with the universal mind and the cosmic ideation. In our quest, we ask ourselves how far the magnitude of the universe reaches, and we see that we will never be able to grasp it because it is endless. Moreover, Taking into account the second fundamental proposition of the secret doctrine, which states the constant change of everything in the universe, we assume that the universal mind, the cosmic ideation, is dynamic and constantly expanding. Thus, our mind, in the image and likeness of the universal mind, is like, likewise constantly expanding. Although the direction in which we are going involves a constant unfoldment of consciousness, which is to lead us to nirvana, this is not, or should not be, our concrete goal. As the Mahachohan said, nirvana is nothing but an exalted and glorious egoism. After all, what matters is not the attainment of that goal. What matters is the inner growth we experience, which, as a side effect, will lead us towards it. Similarly, a side effect is also to become a little wiser. But we are not striving to attain nirvana, nor to become wiser. Our work is directed towards helping our fellows to be free from suffering, helping them towards enlightenment. That is our goal, as the Mahachohan tells us in his letter. Neither nirvana nor wisdom. We learned the masters of wisdom chose the path of compassion and made a vow to help all beings towards enlightenment. This bodhisattva vow is the motive and the training path of all who wish to attain enlightenment for the sake of all beings. The bodhisattva aspirant is not interested in personal enlightenment, but in the cosmic desire for universal enlightenment, and that is an example of all embracing mind, a mind that embraces the universe. And what is an all embracing mind? An all embracing mind implies a constant inner growth that must be useful to us in order to be able to help our fellow men. It implies a limitless compassion for all that exists in the universe. It implies the recognition of the oneness of all that exists in the universe. And the one life manifests in a thousand different forms, which instinctively go in search of unity. 
one all-embracing mind contains within itself the whole universe and is of the same nature as its own source, the primary reality, which inspires consciousness and which inspires mind. All this brings us closer to what we might call a bodhisattva mind. When differentiation occurs in the universe, the state present at the heart of the universe, which is a state of perfect equilibrium and absolute stability, is altered. All the processes of differentiated manifestation then tend to return to the original condition of equilibrium and stability. The human being standing at the turning point of the whole evolutionary process becomes entrenched and identified in separation, individualism and differentiation. He lives in duality. He has the feeling of otherness, of difference, with respect of what is not himself. It is his way of dwarfing his mind, of making it smaller, selective, narrow, when the point is to make it open, all-encompassing. The human being is at that turning point, and it is up to him to reverse the separative tendency and to work to help re-establish that balance and unity at the heart of the universe, at the heart of the cosmos. Says the Bhagavad Gita, at the heart of the cosmos is the one. That one has its sanctuary and altar in the heart of every human being. It is the divine presence seated in the heart of all beings. To overcome duality, the first fundamental proposition of the secret doctrine says that the fundamental unity of all things is that all is one. Progress can only be made if our concern is for the whole and not just for a part, in which case differences, problems, separation, etc., are stimulated. Self-knowledge must lead us to live in this unity of all, to become aware of it, and to incorporate the compassion of the Bodhisattva into our lives. It is the way of the compassionate heart. At the end of the second fragment of the Voice of the Silence, when HPV presents the two paths and the candidate takes the vow of service, he then becomes a bodhisattva in the making and has fulfilled his plane of consciousness. To overcome duality means to live in the oneness of all things, to have transcended the separative mind and to have settled it into a state of buddhi consciousness, a plane of consciousness where there are no barriers, no walls, no doors, where all is one and there is no I and no you, just only oneness. Such must be the mind of a bodhisattva. Modern technology has brought the world together in material terms. Nowadays, everything is immediate and there are no distances. It is a matter of globalization. But today, there is also a need for mental and spiritual unity, not only at the individual level, but also, and above all, at the political and governmental levels. Individual self-interest outweighs the global welfare of humanity. There is an urgent need for that one life vision, which alone 
will bring enlightenment, peace, and security. Without such a spiritual unity of humanity, no progress, social, political, or technological, will be a guarantee of stability and continuity. Only a spiritual vision, like that of a bodhisattva, can establish a new humanity that lives and thinks as a bodhisattva does, from compassion. World peace has been spoken of on a number of occasions, and spiritual self-realization has been mentioned as an effective first step towards that peace. The second step is to become aware of the inexorable effect of all that we think, say, and do. Its impact not only on ourselves, but on our environment and on the rest of humanity through the astral and mental fabric that envelops all. It seems logical and obvious then that it is a matter of becoming aware of the effects of our thinking, feeling, and acting. It is not a matter of having a fun and easy life, nor even of attaining initiation, nor nirvana, but of making this one life succeed in our particular relationships, in our social institutions, and in our case, in the society, in the theosophical society, not as an end in itself, but as a means by which, through it, we may set an example and be an inspiration to the world at large. Let us always keep in mind that what we think, that we become. Therefore, it is necessary to observe our mind, to see what are the mechanisms that trigger preconceived, separative, critical, or judgmental thoughts. And once these mechanisms, which belong to the personal side, are known, to redirect them, to activate the higher aspects of the marvelous vehicle that was given to us many eons ago, so that we could fulfill our destiny as humans, so that we could achieve the fullness of humanity by embodying the ideal of progression and perfection as described by the secret doctrine. Such is the path before us, the way to help bear the heavy karma of the world is with a bodhisattva mind, to be a beacon to others, illuminating their path to truth. In the face of very stumbling block, every setback, it is possible to stop and think, what would a bodhisattva say now? How would he react? What would be in his mind? If we become what we think and try to think like a bodhisattva, what conclusion we can come to? The inner or esoteric path within the heart must be trodden Simultaneously with our outer practice, we must work through the true self. The mountain seems imposing. The way does indeed mean hard work, but we must not be discouraged. The process unfolds at all levels. Huge wide orbits for the great bodhisattvas, great spirals for the medium and little loops for those like us. Each of us has our place in the evolutionary scheme of things, and our only job is to play our part well, and to do it to the best of our ability, starting here and now. Thank you very much. 
नमस्ते